All right, folks, we'll get started here in just a minute. If you want to find a seat, we'll get started in two minutes ago. We'll get started two minutes ago. Yes, let's convene for our Christianette hour, please. If you guys could take a seat in the back. I guess the international sign for beginning is prayer, but I think that's a good thing. And let's all bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful morning. We are so grateful to be here among your people, among our friends, among our loved ones, to hear what you have to say. And Lord, we ask you would open our hearts, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear. We pray that all that we do in this room, looking forward to worshiping you together, would be done to your glory and to your honor. And we pray this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome back, everybody, or if you've been on a trip or back to this class. This is our final class in our series, considering our alignment, misalignment with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Um, and so though I was away last week, I was able to watch T. David's class, which I would highly recommend to you if you were also away and weren't here. Uh, I couldn't agree more with what he said uh, and what he taught on, especially his ex exhortation towards prayer and forgiveness um, in this season. Uh, it's sometimes the simplest and most fundamental of Christian uh, realities that we have to be reminded of the most. And so uh, what I especially appreciated about what uh, I was able to watch back from T. David was that he talks about one of the important um, distinctions that we have in the Reformed faith is, is confessing God. It's not just the Reformed faith, it's just the historic Christian faith. We confess that God is Lord of both the invisible and the visible, creator of all things, visible and invisible. And that Christian forgiveness is part of that invisible reality that we inhabit as Christians. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Dr. Gordon made a pretty trenchant observation that forgiveness is so important that Christ attaches um, God's forgiveness of us, both in parable form and in direct teaching, to our forgiveness of others. It's not an insignificant thing. Not only can we forgive, we must forgive, even in the midst of transgressions against us. And so in other words, the Christological shape, that is the Christ-like shape of our lives should be always seeking to forgive, even when wrongs are currently being done. And so the test for this that Dr. Gordon was, uh, that he gave to us was whether or not we are praying for our enemies, whether or not we are praying for those who persecute us. Just a chapter before in Matthew 5, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. If we want to be children of God, if we want to be sons of our Heavenly Father, then we should be praying for everyone in this season. Not just those we agree with, not even just those we disagree with. If you've been in Kyle's class, you've learned a little bit about disagreement on Wednesday nights. But also those we've experienced hurt from and those we have hurt. Dr. Gordon exhorted us to pray for all by name. He exhorted those of us in leadership here at the church to pray for the presbytery, and especially those in the commission and their families, not just to pray, Lord, I pray for them, but to play, pray for rich blessings, for abundant joy, and for unspeakable joy in the life to come. That does something to us. It does something to our hearts when we pray that way. And um, yes and amen. That is the kind of Christian life, the kind of Christian leadership that we want to have here in this church. Do not let the devil steal your soul while you are trying to save your church. That would be to make the fundamental and crucial mistake that Jesus warned against in Matthew 8 when he says, what, is, what does it profit you to gain the world but to forfeit your soul? That's what Dr. Gordon exhorted us to. Don't do that. So keeping short accounts, this is like basic Christian living. If you're married, you know what this means, keeping short accounts with one another, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. And it was one of the main themes that we encountered on our trip, uh, the eight of us who went to Moscow, Idaho, last week. Many of you know that four couples, the Devlins, the Winklers, the Bennets, the Chases, we traveled last weekend 
to visit a church community out there, and there are three main attributes that happened multiple times that we were exhorted to bring back with us by pastors and families of pastors and elders in that church. They said, come back with joy, cheer, and fruitfulness. We often repeated it to each other over the trip. Be joyful, cheerful, fruitful. That became the thing. The best anecdote to despondency, the best answer to a trial that has come because of our faith is the joy of the Lord that comes from our confidence and relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, it's a simple, fundamental Christian truth that we need to be reminded of, but we, it's so easy to forget or to think that we've graduated from those things. And so we're going to get into some teaching here today. Um, hopefully that will be helpful. Um, and I'm not going to give an exhaustive account right now of our trip to Moscow. Um, it was a very, very good trip. We'd be happy to share more about that with you, but mostly because it's not the pressing need of this morning and of our season. One of the things that Pastor Wilson in Moscow encouraged us not to do is worry too much about steps that are many months, many years down the road. Um, he said, don't worry about the denomination you'll end up in. Focus on the church you have in front of you right now. And Dr. Gordon said something quite similar last week, to focus on discerning first our relationship with the Presbytery by deciding as a congregation, will we stay under their care and oversight? And we'll decide that at our February 4th meeting by a vote. And then after that gets sorted, figure out who you're going to call as a pastor. And then after that gets sorted, work on a process to figure out what denomination you'll affiliate with. But first things first. And so before I leave this topic, I just want to say, if you have questions about that trip, we, we would love to answer them. Um, we will probably write it up at some point uh, in the near future and, and, and ha or have a, a discussion about that trip. Uh, but in the meantime, the Devlins, Winklers, Chases, Bennetts, if you have questions, come ask one of us that went. We'd be happy and glad to share our experience with you. Um, and lastly, since this is our last class in this series, if there's a question that you haven't gotten answered yet, I want to encourage you to talk to an elder. Um, you could talk to one of us on staff if we would be helpful to you. Um, I think we've tried to answer as many questions as we can in the last few weeks, but we might not have gotten to all of them. But as we head into Thanksgiving and Ad Advent, I do want to let you know we will intentionally be putting these, these issues uh, to the side, to be focusing on Sunday worship, on Christ as we await um, Christmas, and caring for the congregation. So we're not trying to ignore this issue, but we felt like we spent six weeks talking about it, and we won't want to continue talking about it, but we're going to be putting that to the side as we focus. Um, Tom and Louise have an Advent series they're going to be doing a Christian Ed Hour, um, and we have a, a sermon series that's referencing in uh, a Beverly Heights tradition called the Sit Tights, awaiting, uh, learning to wait with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that'll be a fun series. I think Kyle and I are putting together something for the kids, a little kids hour, a uh, little sermon time. So it'll be fun. So that's what we're going to be um, doing in the weeks to come. Today, I want to kind of steal Dr. Gordon's framework that he gave us last week and use that as our framework for this morning. Um, he gave us three things to focus on. I just named them, but I'll name them again. He said, first, decide our relationship with the Presbytery. Second, in the interim, discern our responsibility to the Devlin family because they're in a, um, an intermittent state. They're in a resigned state as to Nate's job, but they're not in a dissolved state as to the calling to the church. So that's, that's, there's a limbo there. So what do we do with that? And third, and least pressingly in terms of time, figure out a new denominational affiliation. So those are the three things I want to focus on this morning. And I want to do that in reverse order because the amount of time on each, it's, the last one is quick, quickest and the, the, and the first one it will take the longest. So that's where we're going to go this morning. We'll go backwards. Denominational affiliation, caring for the Devlins, and then um, our relationship with the Presbytery. So um, our denominational affiliation, I just want to acknowledge and say we've begun to talk about this, but this process really hasn't even, uh, we haven't even entered into the process yet. What does that mean? It will take years, and that's not an exaggeration, years for this to come to any kind of fruition. Any ecclesial body, including the CREC that we just visited, would, uh, that we would seek to enter will take multiple years from this point to enter into. There's a lot of work to be done before we can even begin to enter the process of seeking affiliation with another denomination, not the least of which is voting whether or not we're going to stay in our current one or not. So there will necessarily be thoughtful and careful, methodical process that we're going to follow as we seek to enter into another body. And there are three reasons I want to give to you, three reasons why that's going to be a careful and thoughtful process. One, and most importantly, we we're going to honor Christ with our denominational destination. 
We need to be really careful and discerning. Is this a place that honors Jesus? Two, we want to honor Christ in the manner in which we get there. So having a right answer and getting there by shortcuts is not a good way either. So we're going to go to the right place and we're going to get there in the right way. And third, we want to ensure that we don't set ourselves up for failure, either by going into the same kinds of trials we're currently experiencing, nor reacting too quickly to enter the ditch on the other side of the road, simply to react against the current um, challenges that we have, especially at the expense of the first and second priority, getting to the right place and getting there the right way. So I just wanna, I wanna encourage and I wanna affirm, there is no precipitous way that we could possibly get to our next denomination. It will not happen quickly because it can't. It must not happen quickly. It's gonna take time, it's gonna require a lot of patience. Um, and so first, first things first, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. There's a chronological order of things, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, second on Dr. Gordon's list was caring for the Devlins, and what he was beginning to, uh, to tease apart is that sometimes it's hard for us who don't, for those of you who don't live kind of in the, um, like I live and work here, basically, I'm here six days a week. So it makes sense to me that uh, somebody's job um, is connected to but differentiated from somebody's ordination, is connected to and differentiated from somebody's calling. And so Nate has all three of those things, and he's resigned from his job and his position at the church. But officially, according to our denomination and, and our structure, his call is not dissolved. So what does that mean? What is the, how do we make sense of that? He doesn't have a job, and he's still the called pastor of Beverly Heights Presbyterian Church. That's a very strange thing, especially if you're from the business world, where it's like, I have a job, when I resign, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to something else. There are other things that are holding, um, holding that together. And so that was one of the reasons we were going to have a vote. Twice we were going to have a vote as a congregation to, to bring that to a conclusion. That's why one of the things that uh, we would plan to do on the 22nd of October, that got pushed back to the 29th of October, that then got pushed back to today, that then got pushed back again by the administration, uh, the administrative committee's uh, commission's actions, is that we were going to vote on whether or not to dissolve Nate's relationship with the church. Um, but we can't do that. We can't do that right now because the commission is continually um, reviewing our roles and pushing things back. So we, we can't take a vote right now. Because of that, because it's been postponed for nearly a month now, um, and so that we're almost, you know, we're almost a whole month into the process, the session has decided and voted this week, I think you got a letter from Andy, an email uh, in your inboxes, to make something clear that in this interim period, in the in-between, when Nate does not have a job, but he's still connected to our church family, he's welcome to worship in the sanctuary. This should kind of be like, it, it makes sense. It's a no-brainer. But it is a confusing thing when you, um, if, if you're only thinking about resignation as I have a position and I have a job. And so one of the things that the session talked about this week and voted on is to make sure the Devlins feel like they're invited back into the sanctuary. Nate's not entering back into the pulpit. He's not entering back into his role, but it's, it's saying our church family should be together and you're part of our church family. And so I think you, um, I think the Devlins will be here today. I, I would say uh, welcome them back, give them a hug, shake their hands, tell them it's good to see them. It's good for us to be together as a church family uh, even when things are difficult, and probably especially when things are difficult. It's teaching us good habits. The worst thing we can do, I think, in a time like this is to either avoid the trial by pretending it doesn't exist or to run away by, by seeking to, to not enter into it altogether. So I just want to acknowledge that. You probably got an email about that. Um, ask a session member if you have more questions about that, but uh, it, uh, welcome the Devlins back warmly this morning. So lastly, and most of what we're going to talk about today, and hopefully we might have a few minutes for questions, but as I tend to do, I cram a lot of things into a short space, so I may take up all the time this morning, and I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Uh, it's, I hope, ho hopefully this is good for you and for us. Uh, where I want to spend most of our time uh, is our relationship with the POA, but I don't really want to talk about the Presbytery. I want to talk about evangelicalism and its, and its modern and contemporary and popular form and the ways that um, we would say Christian leadership does and does not fit with that and what we think the Bible says about Christian leadership. One of the things that T. David mentioned last week was a guy named J. Gresham Machen. Anybody ever heard of Machen? Is that a name that seven, six of you? Great. Um, 
So Machen was a really, uh, really famous and uh, really powerful character in Presbyterian history. In the 1930s, he's responsible because he wanted to have more profound international missions. He formed his own mission board, and the Presbyterian church that he was a part of at the time said, you can't do that, even though the, the Constitution said you could. And so they defrocked him, and he started uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which is a denomination that still exists today. And ever since that time, ever since Majin in the 1930s had that experience of doing what was allowed, but then the, the administration of that denomination said, you can't do that. Um, there's been something that T. David coined last week, or he said last week that I thought was really helpful, that you can take the man out of the main line, but you can't take the main line out of the man. And if you know any of the history of Presbyterian denominations in the U.S., the main line has a tendency to go from, it, it usually tends to begin in something that is um, tending towards theological and doctrinal purity, and over time the administration of it tends to overtake its theology. And so that's one of the things that T. David has um, reiterated to me a couple of times, and I've been very thankful for his friendship to this church. And I think it's along these lines that I want to talk about um, this morning about the distinctions that we would say makes for good leadership in the church and the ways that that can easily be, um, that, the, that the culture uh, can, can easily infiltrate underneath through, uh, through our better judgment. And so um, first thing I wanna talk about is what Christian leadership is not. And uh, first thing I would say is that cr Christian leadership is not servant leadership. That is intentionally slightly provocative, but bear with me for a little bit as we talk about it. At least it's not servant leadership in the way that we typically mean the word servant and the way that we typically, typically mean the word leadership. I think there's a way we could say that Christian leadership is servant leadership. But first and foremost, the word servant in the Greek, doulos, actually almost always means slave. That's a hard, it's a hard thing to say. We go, slave leadership? Okay, well that's an oxymoron it sounds like, and why would we not talk about that? Well. It's understandable in the West because slave carries a very particular connotation, carries the connotation of Southern slavery. Um, and we usually don't translate the Greek word this way for that reason. It carries all kinds of baggage that we would inappropriately import into the scriptures by using that understanding of slavery and then put it into, into the text. And that's fine. It's actually a good thing to recognize when a word over time in history has become so, so freighted with extra meaning that it becomes problematic. The, the corresponding problem, though, is that the word servant also carries all kinds of connotations that we're importing into the text when we use that word. And so we have an error on the other side. Um, what servant in this phrase should mean is that a Christian uh, is no longer a slave to sin, as, uh, as Paul talks about but is a slave to Christ, and therefore not a slave to the world or to other people. So a servant leader is one who is a servant to Christ, not necessarily to, uh, to others in the way that we think that that means. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but what we tend to mean when we say servant leader, what we tend to mean is that servants give us what we desire. They are my servant. And so a servant leader is one who serves whatever I sense is the right thing to be served by. If a person is a leader and he is a servant leader, then he will make me feel better because whatever I want is probably the right thing and also whoever wants to be first should be servant of all, right? So all of those things mean that a servant leader makes me feel good. But this is not what the Bible means when it calls us to servanthood. That's real small. Maybe some of you can read that. Um, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, Paul says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Did I bold that part? That's an important part. Having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you now are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So obedience, service, slavery in this sense is not a term of brutal subjugation by an overbearing and abusive authority. Jesus is not an abuser, but Jesus is our master. And that is a distinction that we have to make. We become obedient not to the standard of the masses, not to the standard of popularity, not to the standard of a culture, not to the standard of the whims of other individuals, and not even to our own standard, but to the standard of the teaching to which you were committed, the standard of the teaching of Christ. Service has to do with service rendered to Christ by loving him and loving our neighbor, not on his terms or my terms, but Christ's terms. And those are higher terms. Christ's terms are always higher terms. And it's his standard, not ours. And because it's not ours, servant leadership actually means that sometimes we don't get what we want and it doesn't feel good. That's the thing when we say servant that we usually miss. We usually intentionally leave that part out that if someone's going to be a servant leader, it might mean that they make me feel bad because my sin is bad. That's part of the reality of our broken world. Part of the reality of God's standard is a broken and contrite heart is the one that he responds to. And so it sometimes means that we don't get what we want. Now, of course, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean the opposite. It doesn't mean that you only don't get what you want. It doesn't mean that it's always bad. But it does mean that we can't assume that our intuition, that our feelings are a right barometer for uh, for the standard, because God's teaching is the standard, not my, not my feelings about it. Secondly, so that's servant, leadership generally in our world carries a connotation of either elected officials, so people that are elected from the masses, or specialists in a given field that are credentialed in a profession. Those are, that's fine, those are good things, none of, the, none of those are bad. We want people to be, including pastors, to be uh, well prepared. But leadership in the Bible has much more to do with character and the kind of person you have become or are becoming than it does with popularity or credentials. Um, Popular people don't get crucified. This kind of leadership comes with sight and it's the ability to guide others because you have become the kind of person that Christ is leading. Again, this is super small, so sorry. Uh, This is Paul, well, it's about Paul. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, into the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Paul is chosen not because of his credentials or skill or his profession. All of those things actually worked against him in the first place. He was the one who was persecuting the church because of those things. But God used them, and he applied them uh, when God chose to give Paul sight, literally and spiritually. Literally gave Paul sight. But he chooses him to suffer. He chooses him to take his name before the Gentiles. That's the kind of leadership that God is giving to one of the greatest apostles. And so if what we mean by servant leadership is a credentialed professional who knows the wishes of the people and does everything he can to fulfill their desires, then no, servant leadership is not that. That's not what Christian leadership is. If, however, by servant leadership, we mean someone who has suffered for the sake of Christ, his master, who has been given sight by the Lord through trials because he has died to the world and has been given the ability to see the kingdom and to see the sin that so easily entangles and has been given the requisite authority 
to lead the people, then we're getting close. We're getting close to what Christian leadership is supposed to be. Here's, um, here's, here's what David Wells, David Wells uh, at the time uh, was teaching at Gordon Conwell, Systematic Theology at Gordon Conwell Seminary in Massachusetts. And uh, this book was written in 1993. It's called No Place for Truth or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology. Wells wrote, I think, a series of three or four books on, uh, it, was, it's, it was a pretty strong critique of the way that evangelicalism had gone from a strong biblical theology to, um, to being infiltrated by the culture. So the theology was being informed by the culture rather than the culture forming, the, uh, sorry, theology forming culture, and instead the culture was informing the theology. And so um, I just want to read a, about a page and a half from this because I think he says what I'm trying to say better because he's smarter. Uh, so here's what he says. In a democracy, every person's vote has the same weight, regardless of how well or badly informed it is. And in a democratized faith, such as we see in the evangelical world, every person's intuitions are likewise granted equal value. To think otherwise, it is argued, would be to fall into the elitist trap of imagining that some have a larger access to truth and hence deserve a larger religious privilege than others. It was this sort of presumption, predicated on class assumptions, that in the past added passion to the revolution. And in the evangelical world, it is the counter-revolution that is now firmly entrenched. Common access to truth is understood to mean common possession of truth. If everyone's intuitions about God and life stand on the same plane, it is assumed that they are all equally valid, equally true, and equally useful. At the very least, it's become awkward to suggest that intuitions someone has found to be valid, true, and useful might be nothing of the kind. After all, one does not question the propriety of extending the vote, and it seems quite arrogant and offensive to question extending a presumption of common insight. Furthermore, just as politicians hold office only by consent of the sovereign electorate, so church leaders should fulfill their responsibilities within the limits of popularly held ideas. When the religious audience is thus sovereign, its leadership is appropriately refined. The best pollster now makes the best leader. To be sure, this is not a flattering way of describing those leaders um, who have succumbed to popular evangelical sentiment. It is more flattering to talk instead of servant leadership. This has the ring of piety about it, but it is a false piety, for it plays on an understanding of servanthood that is antithetical to the biblical understanding. Contemporary servant leaders are typically individuals without any ideas of their own, people whose convictions shift with the popular opinion to which they assiduously attune themselves. He uses big words. People who bow to the wishes of the body from whom their direction and standing derive. In all this, they show themselves to be different indeed from the one, that's a capital O, the one who embodied what servanthood was intended to be and who never once tailored his teaching to what he judged the popular reception to be. And to suppose that he, Christ, derived the legitimacy to teach from the implied permission of those who heard him is to misunderstand both the Gospels and Christ himself. It is a supposition that also leads to the misunderstanding of Christian faith and why God provides the teachers that it and the church needs. The fundamental requirement of the Christian leader is not a knowledge of where the stream of popular opinion is flowing, but a knowledge of where the stream of God's truth lies. There can be no leadership without a vision of both what the church has become and what under God it should be. Only a genuine leader has such vision. Those who do not, those who are the servants merely of popular opinion, seldom amount to much more than blind leaders of the blind that Jesus castigated. How? It is because in the modern context, at least, popular opinion frequently carries within itself the corruptions of popular culture. And simply because it is so broadly endorsed, popular opinion conveys a sort of legitimacy to this corruption. Almost done. Christian faith should not be defined and driven only by truth. Christian faith should be defined and driven only by truth. That's an important... <laughs> Thank you. I did not. <laughs> As this has been biblically given, more than that, it is the Christian truth that should be taking captive culture, both high and low, the elites and the masses, the special interests of the rich and the poor, men and women, racial minorities and majorities. Christian faith is not a tool for reaching some desired goal, be it psychological, sexual, economic, or racial. 
Christian faith is itself the goal, and the strife among these components in the human story should be serving as the means by which people come to it. Genuine leadership in the church, therefore, is not a matter of finding out what everybody wants and already knows and articulating it. Genuine leadership is a matter of teaching and explaining what has not been so well grasped, where the demands of God's truth and habits of the culture pull in opposite directions. Uh, lastly, there's two more lines over here. To clarify what people do not understand and to mobilize them behind the implication, the implementation of what they do understand is what leadership is all about. The evangelical world does not have an over, does, I'm sorry, yeah, does not have an overabundance of those who can undertake such a responsibility and withstand the pressures to conform to what is widely held, no matter how incorrectly. In the evangelical world, there are many organizers, many man managers, but very few leaders. It's a good book. It's a couple hundred pages of that. Uh, David Wells, No Place for Truth, highly recommended. Um, so so this, this, these are some of the problems. Um, it, it's some of the, the, the things that we import from cultural presumptions into the church, and it's, we get things backwards. One thing that, um, maybe the next thing that, that I would say about Christian leadership, about what it's not, and this will get us into what it is, um, is it's not, it's not primarily about vulnerability. Uh, Andy Crouch, some of you guys might know who that is, wrote a book several years ago called Strong and Weak. And I'm going to pick on him, him here a little bit, but only because two caveats. I've met the man. He's very kind. He's been very kind to me the several times we've met. And he's had several really good insights that have been helpful to me in my Christian walk and my family's Christian walk. And on this point, I think he gets really close, like he's off by like two or three degrees. But by the time you reach the destination, those two or three degrees are, are actually a pretty wide margin of missing the mark. Um, I'm not calling that sin. I just mean he's missing, I think, the point of where he was trying to go. And in his book, he's talking about um, Christian leadership in, uh, in, in the modern evangelical world. And he frames Christian leadership around Christ's leadership, and he does it by graphing authority on the y-axis. Can you see that there? And vulnerability on the x-axis. And I love graphs, and I love this. His insight is super good. And it is, if you then take, okay, if you have high authority and high vulnerability, he's saying that's what leads to flourishing. If you have high authority and low vulnerability, you're now exploiting people. If you have high vulnerability and low authority, you're suffering. And if you have neither, well, then you're withdrawn. You're not really a player. I like this because not only does he say that, he also says quadrants four and two, that left downward diagonal, that's always the choice we think that we have before us, but it's a false choice because that's an either or kind of thinking. Either I have authority or I have vulnerability, but I can't have both. He says when you graph them like this, you can have a both and kind of a mentality. And if you have a both and mentality, you can move yourself into quadrants three and one. And the Christian life is always about going from three to one. And I thought that's a brilliant, I think it's a true and biblical and brilliant insight. And I'm totally going to steal it. And then I'm going to critique him for one of his words. So. 90% of, of, of uh, the props go to Andy for figuring out this, and then 10% goes to, no, okay, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> he's a smart guy, uh, very nice, I just think he's wrong on this point. And so, um, here's the problem. I think authority is absolutely right. Uh, it actually makes sense, it's on the y-axis. Authority is up or down. And it, he defines it as the capacity for meaningful action. I think that's fine, it's a little generic, um, but I think it's fine, capacity for meaningful action authority. Good. But I've always been bothered by vulnerability. And he defined that uh, um, as, uh, what does he say? Exposure to meaningful risk, which I think is actually a pretty helpful uh, definition for vulnerability. But this is where I would disagree with him that, um, and where I think evangelical, the modern evangelical notion of leadership, I think this is where it gets it wrong, because if we're using Christ as our model, Christ did not make himself vulnerable unto death on a cross. He became obedient unto death on a cross. He did not open himself to the exposure of meaningful risk of sin. He becomes sin, who knew no sin. When Jesus says he is the good shepherd because he lays down his life for his sheep, uh, he says, no one takes it from me, that's his life. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. I would say that the corresponding and to authority is not vulnerability. 
It's responsibility. That's what Christian leadership is predicated on. Authority and responsibility. What would happen if we were to graph these two instead? Well, these words were off the top of my head. They maybe could be better, but this is what I had as I was going through it. If we have high authority and high responsibility, let's call that Christian leadership. If we have high authority and low responsibility, that's tyranny. If we have low authority and high responsibility, that's slavery. Uh, and if we have low authority and low responsibility, you could call that withdrawn or isolated or, you know, you're just kind of not, you're not in it. And again, the framework is the false dichotomy is always four to two, that we're always choosing between tyranny or slavery. Well, it's, that's Marxism. If you want, if you want, that's what Marxism believes. Uh, it's always between tyranny or slavery. It's the power. It's oppressed or oppressor. That's the false dichotomy. The Christian life is always about leading from two or three, I'm sorry, isolation or withdrawn into flourishing or leadership. We could keep flourishing there. That's a fine word. But since we're talking about leadership, I wanted to put that word up there. Because taking responsibility for what has been entrusted to you is foundational to all biblical leadership. This was Adam's failure in the garden. What happened? Well, he blamed Eve. He blamed God. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam failed to take responsibility for what was entrusted to him. He was given dominion, and he abdicated because the serpent came in and he did nothing. And this is what Jesus, the last Adam, undoes on our behalf on the cross. He takes responsibility for sin and rebellion, though he is not guilty of any of it. He is obedient to the point of death on the cross. And what does the next verse say? In, uh, what is that, Philippians? Um, Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Or in Matthew 28, after all of the gospel is completed, after his death, after his resurrection, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Why? Because he was obedient unto death. He was obedient. He took responsibility for all that God had entrusted to him. He says that in John. I've not lost a single one that you've given to me. And authority flows to those who take responsibility. That's a biblical concept of authority. And it flees from those who shirk from it. If you shirk responsibility, authority flees from you. The biblical model of leadership is when authority and responsibility are correct and commensurate. They're held together in equal amounts by the person who is supposed to be holding them. So what does this mean, Peter? You have 10 minutes left. Draw it, bring it to a conclusion. Graphs are nice, but what do I do? Well, um, our lives should be Christ-shaped as Christians. Christian leadership should also be Christ-shaped. What we mean by this is that Jesus is the Son, the way to the Father, and there is no way to him without, there is no way to the Father without the Son. So how do we, how does that look practically? Well, here are, are a bunch of practical things. This is just quoting from the Bible small again. If you're a child, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you in the land that you live in. Consequently, it's also the job of the parents to make sure that the kids obey, because if the kids disobey you, then they're disobeying God. It also means that parents have to be obeyable. I mean, you can't be rash, you can't be inconsistent, you can't be heavy-handed, and you can't be absent. So if you are making it impossible for your kids to obey you by never being there, you're also helping them to disobey God. So that's a, that's a reality. It's pretty simple. It's like basic, but it's like, oh, that does mean something for me, doesn't it? I better be obeyable as a father. If a father, it means don't provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You can't shirk responsibility. You can't shirk discipline in the home if you're a father. Children learn to love their heavenly father by learning to love their earthly father. And watching you, the Father, love the Lord. So you have to be loving and lovable. But part of this teaching um, is teaching them right and wrong. It's black and white. Making disciples happens when you are disciplining. Discipline, disciple, same, same root word. It also means husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. So there's no room for selfish egotism. Men are called to give up their lives, to lay them down for their wives, the way that Christ did on the cross. 
This is not a call to barbarism or chauvinism. It's a call to Christ-like responsibility and authority for leadership in the home. If you're an older man, you are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. We need the gray-haired or the no-haired. It's fine. I'm going to be that. Uh, men among us, we need that. I need that as a young man. Um, and young men are called to be self-controlled. What about the What about the ladies? If you're a mother, it means to love your husband and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to your own husband, that the word of God may not be reviled. There's an order in the home, and it's a good order, and there's no getting around it. In the Christian life, the husband is head of the wife by God's design, and this is a blessing. It's a blessing, and it's meant for the flourishing of the family. And it's why importing the world's categories will never work in the Christian life. And it's why the evangelical world is often tottering and struggling because it's trying to marry two things together that can't be. If you're an older woman, you are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. You are to teach what is good and so train the young women for everything in the verse before um, in the Christian way of life. We need godly older women who in their years of faithful service to Christ probably know Jesus better than all of the teachings that we could combine from all of the books written uh, um, in texts that could ever supply. And for everyone, for everyone, it means to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle. Who can argue with this stuff? To be perfect and courteous towards all people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up div division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and is self-condemned. This is literally just down the middle Bible stuff. I just, just like went through that, that one, that one, that one, that one. What's practical? These things are what it means to live like Christians. And this is the basis of what it means to be a Christian leader in the church. It's not just about proof texting scripture. It's not just about duty. Let me find all the to-do lists in the Bible and then, and then put them together. It's not just about rules. It's not duty at the expense of love. Obedience is important, but obedience comes with godly affection. Part of what we are commanded to obey is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. And at the risk of confusing you with the two or five minutes that I've got left, I have one more graph. One more graph. Love and obedience. I think I use the word affection and obedience, but what I mean is Christian love, agape love and obedience. If we map affection and obedience on this two by two, what I want to say is that what modern evangelicalism gets right is a desire for affection of God. They want to help individuals love the Lord Jesus Christ. You see it on with the music, on the radio, you see it in devotional literature, in, in the movies and books that, that get put out. The aim of that kind of ministry, I want to say, it's good to love the Lord. Yes and amen. Half of it is right. It's halfway there. You see, legalism, on the other hand, it wants to obey all of the things. Uh, and Kyle and I were actually having a debate upstairs. Is legalism really without affection, or do people really love legalism? It's like, yeah, well, maybe their loves are disordered. Well, anyway, we had an argument, but it was good. Disagreement? Disagreement. <laughs> The false choice that we always think there is, is do I love God or do I obey him? Do I go from a kind of warm faith or a kind of obedient faith that has no heart to it? It's not just about rules, right? So I have to be an evangelical. Well, I'm an evangelical, and I want to say that we're in the top right category, that we want to seek both affection for God and obedience to his word. And so the actual choice I would submit in the Christian life is from three, rebellion, or Christ-like character. That's where we're always trying to move. And as long as we get stuck in the 4-2 paradigm, we're always missing the point of what we're trying to be as Christians. Um, the problem is in modern evangelicalism, the world is far too much with us. The kinds of scandals that rock the evangelical world in churches and in ministries are often the same scandals that rock the rest of the world. It's usually about sex or money or something like that. Or consider the verses I just read. Um, how many evangelicals, even us in this room, get skirmish about the word submit? Uh, don't use that word. What does that word mean? But we can't pretend to love Jesus if we don't love his word. When Jesus says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. 
And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is where I submit that modern evangelicalism tends to fail. Let us love God, but only as far as everybody else has already agreed is acceptable. Remember the false choice, the four and the two. It's not legalism and, and evangelicalism. We want to go from rebellion to Christ-like character. I think that the choice is always this. It's always Christ or chaos. It's God's law of love or it's man's lawless living. It's the kingdom of heaven or it's hell on earth. Those are the, those are the, that's the dichotomy that we have. And we are called as faithful Christians in every circumstance, every external circumstance, to be faithful, to be loving, and to be obedient. And whether we're in the relative comfort of Western PA, which is pretty comfortable, or under some incredibly oppressive regime throughout history, the word of God does not change. It is changeless. And so far as the external circumstances depend on us, I would say that we are required, not just privileged, required to live as lovingly and obediently as Christ has commanded us. And when we are given responsibility to lead in the church, we must take that authority seriously. And the degree to which we are hindered from taking up that mantle, the degree to which obedience to Christ is being interfered with by others in authority in the church, is the degree to which we must resist and seek to be free from that interference. And so looking ahead this Advent, as we go through Thanksgiving, I want to say that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on Christ. We're going to be looking to him, seeking to love him and to obey his word. Advent is all about waiting. That's what the word means. And we're going to be waiting on him and with him. We're going to be waiting in him. We don't want to focus on the divisions. We don't want to focus on the arguments that we're necessarily engaged in until February 4th. We want to focus on Christ. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do everything we can to accomplish that. We're going to trust that he's sovereign. We're going to trust that he is guiding us. We're going to trust that he is leading us. And that all that is needful and right is for us to love him and to keep his word. Next year, Kyle, uh, in early January, is going to have a Saturday seminar. He's going to talk about some of this stuff. He'll, more information will come out about that. I think that's exciting. Um, but that's what we want to do. That's what I kind of want to end the class with, because I have used up all the time. And I talked really fast in order to say all the things I wanted to say. Hopefully you followed along. Um, in every age, in every generation, we have to discern. We have to decide what it means to love and obey God's truth in this context. Every context is different. And simultaneously, we have to reject the lies of the world which attempt to make their way into the church. And this is what we believe Christian leadership looks like. Authority and responsibility commensurately held, love and obedience in Christ. And to that end, that's, that's what I want to, if I had more time to make another graph, I'd probably try to figure out how fruit of the spirit maps onto this somehow. How love, joy, and peace all work in there, and what are the opposites of those, and we could, we could have a lot of fun with that. I could send them to you. Um, yeah, they'll be in the video too. So I guess drawing it to a conclusion, I, I'd ask you to consider where you are on, on those spectrum, on, on that graph, on those two-by-twos. Where is your heart? Where are we as a church? Where is God calling us? Um, and that's something that we can use. It's a tool you can use in your, in your sort of mental toolbox as you're thinking and discerning and working through all of these things. So our time's up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you give us not just um, intimations of your will, but, Lord, you give us clarity by your word. You give us your spirit. You give us your very self. We give you thanks for what you have done for us on the cross, and we pray that you would help us in our hearts and our minds to be turned more into Christ's likeness through our love and obedience to you. We pray for our church. We pray for each member of it. We pray for every family that is here, whether they're visitors or active members um, or part of this congregation in any way. We pray your rich blessing upon them. We pray your blessing upon the Presbyterian of the Alleghenies, Lord, that you would make fruitful the hands that are set to work for your kingdom. We pray for the Administrative Commission, all five of those men and their families, for rich blessing, for joy in their lives, for joy unspeakable in eternity. We give you thanks that you have given us your word, given us your direction. We pray that you would guide us in all wisdom as we are seeking to guide your church. We trust you and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.